All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me uh, and everyone is safe and well. Uh, I'm Ann Massey Badmus. And just to check for technical uh, issues, please let me know if you can hear me by putting in um, yes in the chat pane. So if you can hear me, please say yes. Perfect. I'm getting a lot of yeses, so it sound that's great. So again, welcome. I'm Ann Massey Badmus, and uh, we're here to talk about COVID-19. COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on pretty much everything uh, throughout the world, but especially in the United States. And immigration is no different. So we're going to take about an hour to go over. Uh, what is going on right now with immigration um, in the United States and try to clarify and update uh, some of the things that uh, we are seeing in the uh, immigration process. So uh, let me move on to the next slide. So our agenda today is really covering most of what uh, my practice is hearing from clients as to questions or concerns about uh, the COVID-19 situation and its impact on different areas of immigration. So we're going to talk about uh, COVID-19 and the public charge rule. Uh, we're going to talk about maintaining legal status uh, during this time. Um, and then uh, also for employers and employees, uh, especially those who are in H-1B status, what are the uh, things that employers and employers, or some of the things that employers and employees can and cannot do uh, during this um, situation. And then we're going to talk about immigration uh, government process updates. What's going on with the government and how are they uh, processing applications and, and what to kind of expect from there. And then lastly, we are going to have an opportunity for questions. I'm sure there are many people who have questions. So we will have a Q&A session. And just to let you know, you can go ahead and ask your questions while I'm going through the presentation, but be sure to put your questions at the bottom uh, or, or the area that's marked questions underneath your video. There is a section uh, called questions where you can type in your questions. That's the best way of, for us to track and answer questions. So instead of using the chat pane, uh, please use the question and answer area underneath the video section of the webinar. So you will have to scroll down and look for that and put in your questions there. We will um, ask that uh, you keep to one question because we have a lot of people on the call. So we want to make sure that we answer everybody's question as best we can. So uh, please limit yourself to one question and make sure that it is a general question such as uh, when do we expect the USCIS offices to open, but not something specific that really per, um, is specific to your situation where you are kind of revealing confidential information. So we want to be sure that we, do, you know, this is a public forum. Uh, if you have a question that's specific to you, uh, your circumstances, then feel free to contact me um, to set aside time to talk about your specific case. But this is not uh, the forum to to provide that uh, kind of information. All right. So um, moving on. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Ann Massey Badmus, and I have been practicing immigration law for over 25 years, um, and I've seen a lot of changes. Nothing like COVID-19. So you know, I'm I'm uh, certainly uh, kind of. See, um, seeing new, new areas and new ground, but hopefully I can help keep you updated as to uh, what, what's going on. So, as I mentioned before, the, the one of the questions that we get quite a bit uh, recently is uh, COVID-19 and pretty about COVID-19 and the public charge rule. And, and that's kind of a general, you know, heading for that, but what we're getting are questions like, what benefits are available for, for me, uh, for immigrants, uh, that will not affect my immigration status? Um, there are a lot of you know, um, programs out there now um, from the government to kind of help people get through this crisis. And so, but immigrants are, are rightly concerned whether or not those programs will impact their uh, status or 
uh, eligibility for citizenship or eligibility for any other um, visas or benefits out there. So what we want to look at is um, the public charge rule. Now, the public charge rule is it's pretty it's new, but not so new. So what we have today is a new public charge rule that starts started February 24th, 2020. Before that, there was always a requirement for those, particularly those applicants for green cards through a family-based application to show that they had sufficient support and would not uh, be likely to, to take advantage of public certain public benefits. But with the new public charge rule that came out recently, um, anybody who is applying for a temporary visa, whether it's a work visa, uh, temporary work visa or for a, a green card through any process um, has to show that they ha are not going to be um, or are not likely to to be using public benefits. Now, why is that important? Because the use of some public benefits can actually cause denial or make make you inadmissible which means that your application for a visa or a green card can be denied because of use of past uh, past use of public benefits. This can be overcome in some ways, but it is um, an issue that would arise if you use certain public benefits. The, the benefits um, that would cause denial are, are too many to cover. So what I'm going to really talk about are what is allowed for immigrants, uh, applicants um, for immigration benefits to use. So there are many allowed benefits where if you use these types of benefits, uh, government benefits or public benefits, they are not considered to be an issue or cause uh, you to be inadmissible uh, or cause your application to be denied. Uh, the ones I've listed here are some of the benefits. There are more, but these are ones I think that are kind of more relevant to what's going on now with the COVID-19. Um, crisis. So emergency medical assistance is not, um, if you need to have emergency medical assistance that <clears throat> is uh, possibly uh, paid for by uh, state or federal benefits, that is not considered a, uh, a uh, public charge um, denial or not be considered for a public charge denial. Uh, health insurance under the ACA or Obamacare, if you are able to uh, or do qualify for Obamacare uh, insurance, use of that is not considered to be public charge uh, in admissibility. Social Security and Medicare are, is another area that's an allowed public benefit. But most importantly, I think that really kind of applies for most people or a lot of people um, that are um, either being temporarily uh, furloughed or um, are permanently um, uh, terminated from their positions is unemployment benefits. So we get a lot of questions on whether unemployment benefits are, or some people actually do believe that unemployment benefits are something they're not eligible for. Um, most of the time, if you have been uh, legally authorized to work, uh, you've paid into unemployment benefits. So each state is different, but if you do apply for unemployment benefits and are qualified for that, the use of unemployment benefits is not an issue for your um, immigration status or application. Uh, so uh, the other areas are um, other benefits that uh, people are concerned about is what if I do get COVID-19 and I you know, cannot pay for that treatment? I don't have insurance. Um, you know, I have um, uh, limited funds to pay for the, the treatment. Uh, well, the government has said that if you have uh, to get um, federal funding or if your if your health care is funded by even things like Medicaid um, related to COVID-19 such as testing treatment or preventative care uh, that would not be considered a public charge uh, in admissibility benefit so you know definitely they the USCIS the Department of Homeland Security has stated that they do want people to use those benefits if needed do not um, you know, forego those benefits because of concern about uh, public charge. And then the last area, which we'll go a little more in depth in the next slide, is the tax related cash benefits. These are um, not necessarily just the COVID-19, but what we'll talk about is if there is a uh, credit or refund that's available to you, such as the COVID-19 recovery rebates or what's called the uh, stimulus, stimulus checks, 
then that is not considered a public benefit or a public charge uh, an admissibility benefit as well. Uh, one other thing to know about the public charge rule, because we have gotten questions from people who are permanent residents or, or and thinking about applying for citizenship, uh, the public charge rule does not apply to permanent residents. Um, so if you're a permanent resident, you know, there's pretty much unlimited benefits um, usually um, available. If you're qualified for a, a benefit, then that does not impact your eligibility for citizenship or affect your uh, ability to remain um, as a permanent resident. There are other um, categories or exempted uh, persons from the public charge rules, such as those who are asylees or refugees, uh, those who are applying for temporary protected status, and of course, U.S. citizens and nat including naturalized citizens are not uh, uh, covered, are not required to comply with the public charge rule. So keep that in mind as well. So um, the next, let me just check to make sure everybody's okay with um, with the uh, sound. Uh, please just confirm you're hearing me okay by putting yes in the chat pane. Um, so the next area is um, that we wanna talk about, which is again, related to the public charge rule, but really um, you know, something very, very new is the uh, CARES Act, the Corona, by, uh, the, the CARES Act, which Congress uh, is an acronym that Congress um, has made for the C Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act. The CARES Act is a very long uh, new law um, into, that has put in place with a lot of different benefits. Um, but what we're going to focus on are some of the, um, the, the main benefits that might be of concern to immigrants um, as to whether they are eligible uh, or whether it will impact their um, uh, immigration status by using some of these benefits. So as I mentioned in the earlier slide, um, those, the recovery rebates or the stimulus checks are really considered tax, it actually in the CARES Act itself are considered tax related um, benefits. So they would not be considered public charge if you are eligible uh, for the uh, recovery rebate. Use of the use or acceptance of that rebate does not make you a public charge in most circumstances. So um, keep in mind that uh, I'm, I'm here really just to talk about the immigration um, impact, if any, of using this, uh, these rebates. But um, whether you're qualified or not really uh, should be something to address with a tax advisor. But just generally, my understanding of the qualifications for these recovery rebates is for individuals with an adjusted gross income on their 2018 or 2019 tax return. Um, of under $75,000 is uh, are eligible for $1,200, a uh, one-time $1,200 um, recovery rebate. Um, if you're a married couple with an adjusted gross income under $150,000, then $2,400 uh, is uh, maybe uh, sent to you. However, uh, the, if for children, if you have a number of children under the, uh, for each child under the age of 17 in your household, you may be qualified to get a another $500 per child. Now, if you do qualify under these um, requirements, then uh, in the next step to consider if you are not a citizen of the US is whether or not you meet either the green card test or the substantial presence test. So the green card test simply means that you are a permanent resident, a lawful permanent resident, you have a green card. So if you have that, you are certainly eligible for that rebate, provided that you meet all the other financial requirements. However, um, if your um, the other test would be the substantial presence test. Now, this would apply to anyone who's a resident alien with a work visa or work authorization. Um, now, substantial presence means basically that you're not a permanent resident, but you have some other legal status and you have been physically present in the United States for the majority of the time. And so therefore you should be eligible for the recovery rebate if you meet the other financial requirements. However, there is a distinction for many that is important to consider. If you must have a social security number, number one as the um, individual taxpayer, and you must have um, not filed 
a tax return for 2018 or 2019, which included a spouse who does not have a social security number. So for example, if you are an H-1B employer, employee, and uh, you filed, of course, you have the social security number, you meet all the other requirements. However, your spouse is on H-4 and does not, or child is on H-4 and does not have a social security number. Rather, they uh, you might have used an individual taxpayer identification number, I-10, then you would not be eligible for the rebate at all. So that is something that could probably exempt a lot of people, um, not just those that we're discussing as far as um, H-1B workers, but it could be other temporary work visa holders as well, or even those who have permanent or permanent residents or U.S. citizens um, that have a, a spouse or child who does not have a social security number because perhaps they don't have legal status yet. And so those individuals will also not be eligible for that recovery rebate. Okay. Now, keep in mind, there are other um, programs out there that are of uh, state benefits. For example, state or local uh, cities might have their own programs for helping throughout this time. So um, oftentimes those programs do not have limitations in terms of legal status. So for example, in, um, I read yesterday in Chicago, uh, they have a program for helping uh, those who those in need and regardless of immigration status. So you want to also check for any other programs in your state or city that might be a, a benefit to you as well. And as long as you meet those requirements, you should not have uh, an issue with um, public charge rule. The other area of the CARES Act that we've received a lot of questions about is the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or these programs for business owners. Um, there are many non-citizen business owners uh, either having a, uh, either they have green cards or uh, they're foreign companies uh, owning uh, U.S. companies or they're on E2 uh, or the owners are have E2 visas or some other visa um, and they have employees that they're, that they, you know, have um, operating their business. So the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP has authorized up to 300, almost $350, $350 billion dollars in forgivable loans to small businesses. And so these, um, this, these loans are available to all businesses, whether they're nonprofits, um, sole proprietorship, you're, you're the only owner, uh, you're self-employed, uh, independent contractors. If you have 500 or fewer employees, then you can apply for this. And uh, there was some confusion earlier uh, when this program was first announced, but uh, as recently as yesterday, the government has clarified that non-citizens can apply. So even though you're not a citizen, but you have a business and you have been employing employees and you meet the other qualifications of the loan program, um, you are eligible and it, should, it would not have an impact on your uh, immigration status as well or eligibility for future immigration benefits. And again, keep in mind, as I mentioned before, there are many programs available on state and local levels as well. So you might want to look into those and, and see if those were, uh, you meet those requirements as well. Okay, so the next area I wanna talk about is just maintaining legal status. This is a question we get a lot because people are concerned. They're here on different visa statuses uh, or they may be in, um, concerned about termination of their work visas because of termination of employment or furloughs, those types of things. So I want to address briefly what you can expect with, uh, with this um, area or what you should be thinking of um, depending on your circumstances. Again, this is very general because we don't have time to cover every circumstance out there for individuals. But the main thing for people to be aware of, uh, number one, is regardless of what status you have, whether it's a visitor, student, um, or any uh, worker status, you want to be sure that you verify your I-94 expiration date. Um, the I-94 is what controls the length of time that you can remain in the U.S. legally. 
um, not your visa. So you may have a, a visitor visa. You came in with a visitor visa um, that may be a 10 year visitor visa. Well, that doesn't it doesn't mean you can be in the United States for 10 years. But what it does what does control how long you can be here is your I-94, which is an electronic document uh, that is generated when you enter the country on your visa. Um, so you do need to go to this website that I have listed here um, to make sure that that I-94 uh, is correct, number one, because oftentimes uh, we have seen uh, I-94s that are incorrect. Uh, for example, uh, the the uh, officer dates the I-94 less than the uh, H-1B authorization time, for example, or um, they just may not just be totally incorrect. So you want to check that, number one. And number two, you want to be sure that you understand what is the expiration date of your status. So if it's correct, you want to be sure that you are, made, are <clears throat> excuse me, do what you need to do in this time where you might not be able to leave the US within an expiration date. Uh, so you might need to do things such as apply for an extension or change of status before that expiration date. It's usually critical for uh, someone who needs to extend their status, um, like extend their visitor stay or extend their H-1B or extend um, any visa to apply before the expiration date of your I-94. Um, so if you can do an extension, you definitely want to get that into place um, well before the expiration date. And if it's for the reasons of I can't go back uh, because of the COVID situation, uh, there's no flights available, whatever is the um, issue, that is, um, I would say, a legitimate reason. And we don't know yet whether the government is going to approve those um, extensions, but by applying for them, it automatically, it usually, well, typically extends your your uh, your legal stay in the United States. So it's important to make sure that you at least apply, even if ultimately it's not approved. You still would have maintained your legal stay beyond that, beyond your expiration date. If you can't or were not able to file uh, or did not and, and don't have enough time or for, for some reason could not file before the expiration date, you can apply late. However, you have to prove what are the circumstances that caused you, the extraordinary circumstances that caused you to file late. And sometimes the government can, can forgive that late filing and still approve you for your extension or change of status. And that kind of goes into the next point, which is the terminated H-1B employers who, um, H-1B workers, I'm sorry, H-1B workers, if your employment has been terminated, whether for COVID or any other reason, um, then you do have a one-time uh, ability to remain in the United States for 60 days and file a new um, H-1, or well, first you have to find a new position and file and have that new employer file for your change of employer petition before that 60 day grace period is over. Um, we don't know whether the government might extend that 60 days or forgive that, uh, forgive you if you uh, apply later than 60 days uh, because of the COVID uh, issue, but that's something that um, you, you know, definitely want to to uh, speak with your attorney about because it's definitely something you want to consult with an attorney about to see what your options are specifically and whether or not uh, you know it's worthwhile to ask for that kind of forgiveness for a late filing or whether you need to plan to uh, you know return back at a certain time in order to get your uh, visa stamp and return to the return to the U.S. if you found a new employer. So those are just kind of some of the, the um, maintenance of legal status issues that we run across. I'm sure you'll have other questions and I'll try to answer those as we get to the Q&A session. But I just wanna be sure that people understand that maintenance of legal status is very important. Unfortunately, the government has not, um, has not overall said that, the, uh, that you know, this COVID situation um, kind of alleviates your need to file uh, an extension or a change of status in a timely manner that may change um, or even um, extending for an employment authorization document for example but 
<clears throat> we will see what happens with that. But right now, assume that you need to maintain your legal status and follow the rules as they are as closely as possible. The next um, area I will talk about is the H-1B employer um, compliance. Em employers have you know, many uh, requirements when they have a uh, visa worker. Uh, there are many different types of visas. Uh, I'm really, because of the time limitation, really focused on the H-1B employer compliance because that really is the one that most people run across and has really the most uh, restrictions for employers or requirements for employers in any other visa. Um, so with the H-1B, uh, we're getting questions from employers as to, you know, um, because of the circumstances, economical circumstances with COVID-19, they may need to lower a wage or would like to consider lowering uh, salaries for their employees. And so the concern is, can we do this for H-1B uh, employee, or H-1B employees? Can we lower their salaries? And uh, the government is still, has not, the government is very clear on that at this point and has not changed the rule, which is basically that wages cannot be lowered from what is in the original application unless there is a new filing of a labor condition application and a new H-1B amendment. So the if you want to lower wages, the paperwork needs to be done in advance of that before those wages can be lowered. Um, in these times, that's, that is an extra layer of um, work that the employer has to do in order to, to lower those wages. But in any event, it cannot lower the wage any less than what the government says is the minimum prevailing wage for that, for the um, for the location that of work, so uh, before lowering wages uh, of H-1B employees, employers need to be sure to uh, talk with the attorneys and find out what the next steps are in order to do that. Another area that uh, is not allowed for H-1B employees, or another um, possible relief uh, for employers that is not allowed for H-1B employees, is the furlough. So temporarily. Uh, laying off or temporarily um, uh, stopping payment for H-1B uh, workers because there's no work available, but still keeping them as an employee is considered benching. And the government has been very clear that there's no benching allowed, which means that furlough is not allowed for H-1B employees. What that means is that employers must continue with uh, employment or payment, even if there is no work to be done during this period. Um, if you if you are able to have the employee work at home and you've offered to all your employees to work at home, then uh, the other requirement that you need to be aware of is that you may need to post the current labor condition application in the employee's home within 90 days of relocating that employee to their home. So for example, if you have an H-1B employee who can work from home and you have um, had them working from home since um, March 28th, uh, then by April 28th, you need to make sure that the employee, as odd as it sounds, posts their LCA in, in their home, whether it's on the refrigerator or in their, room, their bedroom, wherever, they need to put that um, LCA there and they need to sign off that they've done that so that you can keep that compliance requirement in your uh, public access file. Now, if you're unable to continue that employer's employee's work uh, or, or uh, employment, then you must, and the employer must offer return transportation to the home country. So the employee must be given the uh, airfare needed in order to return back to their to their home country or leave the United States. It doesn't have to be the home country, but to leave the U.S. Uh, and then you have to notify the USCIS as well. And the final thing is that H-1B workers have to be offered the same benefits as any other U.S. workers. Uh, so if you have any benefits like specific uh, sick leave or any other benefits that you give to other employees um, because of COVID-19 or any other reason, then H-1B employee, employee workers must have the same benefits as well. So I see we have a lot of questions and so we're almost getting to the end so we can get to the questions. Um, the next uh, area I wanted to cover is just the uh, immigration process. 
what's going on, and hopefully some of this will answer some of the questions that you have there with respect to how the government is treating applications, uh, what can we can expect in terms of processing, uh, some of the um, announcements that have happened as a result of COVID-19 or USCIS and, um, and other immigration agency announcements. So uh, in one thing that probably everybody has noticed is that the USCIS, which is the, the agency that really has the most um, uh, involvement with immigration in the United States, has closed all of its offices to the public until May 4th, 2020. This might be extended in, more, in all likelihood, it may be extended. But as a result, all the interviews that were scheduled uh, up through May 4th and even after, because we're seeing notices um, for cancellations for people who have interviews even after May 4th, all the interviews um, are being canceled and will be rescheduled. Now, typically what we're seeing is that um, the, the expectation is or the government is saying we should be rescheduling within 90 days. However, considering the numbers of um, applications that are being rescheduled and, and canceled, uh, the application interviews that are being rescheduled and canceled, it, it may take longer than 90 days. I mean, we're on uncharted ground here. It's just a, just a guesstimate at this point whether or not your interview will be rescheduled within the 90 days. It may not be, uh, or we may not actually even get a notice until 90 days later um, so I would probably caution people to expect it may take another six months before your interview is, is rescheduled. Um, so don't, so, so just, to, just to set your expectations, if you get them earlier, that's great, but I would not expect any, any quick response to interview rescheduling um, from the USCIS. Also, the USCIS has suspended all naturalization ceremonies, so there are no new citizens, unfortunately, being sworn in. So even if you've had your interview uh, and you're expecting to have your, uh, in, your naturalization ceremony to actually become a citizen or you had a ceremony scheduled and it's being rescheduled, uh, it has been canceled, uh, you know, all those things are, are happening. So basically what we're expecting is are hopeful that um, they will give priority to the naturalization ceremonies once the um, once the offices are back open and operations are normal, so that we can get people sworn in as citizens as soon as possible. And the last uh, closure that I'll talk about are the U.S. embassies, which is controlled by our Department of State. They have canceled all visa appointments; are not scheduling any new visa appointments until further notice. We have no indication as to the time frame of when these visa appointments will be um, allowed. So this applies not only to visitor application, vis visas, um, H-1B visas, any other visas out there, but also the immigrant visas, which are green card applicant visas, uh, our appointments are also uh, canceled. So unfortunately, we do not have an indication of when that will happen. Uh, when that when we will get uh, appointments rescheduled. The last update I'll talk about is the application processing update. So while yes, the USCIS is closed to the public, it is still open to receive new applications and and is continuing to process applications. So uh, some people have asked, well, isn't it should we apply now because the offices are closed? And my answer is yes, uh, you should definitely apply now, especially if you need an extension, if you need, um, uh, or if you want to apply for citizenship, uh, apply for the green card, apply for any benefits for which you're eligible, you should definitely uh, apply now to get yourself into the queue for processing because we do expect that things will end up being more delayed than ever, even though the delays have been pretty bad before COVID-19, we can expect that the delays will be even longer. So you don't want to kind of keep your application on the back burner or not have it even in process um, because of um, you know concerns with COVID-19. You want to get your application into the queue so that it can be processed uh, whenever the government can you know um, move that application along. Um, one of the, so if you are processing, one good thing that the USCIS has said is that if you are submitting new application, typically original signatures are required on petitions and applications, but they are now accepting 
uh, scanned, copied, or faxed uh, signatures. So in working with your attorney, if you uh, you know have an application, instead of having to send the original application to the attorney to submit it, you can sign it, uh, uh, scan it, and email it to the attorney. And we can use that to file your application to so save some time uh, and postage and, and need to be concerned about going outside to, to get your uh, application uh, mailed off. Um, there are the other good thing that the government has uh, done is to uh, extend deadlines for requests for evidence, uh, meaning that if you have a case and you've received a request for more information uh, to respond, uh, usually you, there's a deadline given, uh, but if you receive that request for evidence between March 1st and May 1st, um, then that deadline, whatever the deadline is um, stated in your request for evidence, is extended for another 60 days. So if you only had 30 days to respond, you now have up to 90 days to respond because of the COVID crisis. Um, the other thing that is not so good that's happened is premium processing has been suspended. Now, premium processing is a process allowing for some temporary worker visas as well as some green card uh, uh, employment-based green card applications to be processed more quickly by paying a premium processing fee uh, of about $1,400. That process has been suspended, so they have not extend. So basically what you can expect is that your application will be put into the queue and hopefully if they're able to process quickly, they will, but you know, it's really um, difficult to determine how long that will take. So. Um, the last thing is, as I mentioned before, there's still no extensions to visa status and work authorization expiration. So if your work authorization is expiring, if your visa status is expiring, as I mentioned before, you need to be sure to file for your extensions uh, before the expiration date. Um, there is a pending lawsuit from the American Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, which was filed earlier this week. Our early last or last week that um, is demanding that the US CIS kind of suspend these requirements to file before expiration dates because of the COVID-19 situation. So that may happen, uh, but we don't know that as of yet. All right, so now we've come to the Q&A session and I see we have a lot of questions, okay? I want to repeat that uh, you should put your questions into the Q&A section below the uh, video. We are asking for one question per person because we have a lot of people on this call. So we want to be sure to be able to get to everybody's question um, and we'll try to do that. But if not, uh, we're not able to do that, then we will respond via email uh, to your question and, and send that out to the group as well. Um, again, let's keep the questions very general and not about your specific case because this is a public forum and we do not we want to maintain confidentiality. So if you have a specific question about your specific situation or case, feel free to contact me directly for that. All right, so let's get to the first question. Um, so the first question I have is, when will premium processing restart, especially for 01? Will it still be two weeks time for premium processing when it restarts? So that's a difficult question to answer because it, we, really, we really can't know um, yet as to uh, when they were. The government has not announced it. Uh, if they restart premium processing, it will probably be for all applications, whether it's H1 or O1, uh, and they probably will keep to the two weeks timing or the 15 day timing. Um, but considering the uncertainty of these times, I my guessing is it's, it's probably going to be a few months or so before um, that happens. Now. Um, for certain, uh, there is an expedited request process. Um, it is not uh, guaranteed to anyone like premium processing is. However, my suggestion for those who are physicians is to request for expedited processing because I believe the government has at least stated that they will try to expedite those um, visas or applications for physicians or healthcare workers so that they can get, you know, these healthcare workers, um, uh, you know, helping with the COVID crisis or keep them helping with the COVID crisis as much as possible. So 
you should definitely uh, use the expedited process. It is a, a basically, um, I would suggest to put on your application or on your application a request for expedite, as well as once it's filed, uh, the attorney should call and ask for the expedite as well. The next question is, can an employer reduce hours for a J-1 employee during a pandemic? So I think the, that I answered that a little bit earlier with the H-1B compliance area. So a J-1 waiver employee would be a, a would be would have an H-1B visa, uh, and in that case they cannot reduce. Uh, well, they can reduce hours. Uh, however, that has to be done uh, through a, a new petition, H-1B petition. So they can't reduce it automatically unless the H-1B petition included um, the original H-1B petition included um, a, a, a hourly uh, range and that and they are actually uh, reducing it no less than the hourly range or the minimum uh, hours that are stated in the H-1B petition. But if it's a full-time H-1B petition for, uh, or H-1B petition for full-time work, then the employer cannot reduce hours unless they actually file an amended H-1B petition uh, asking to reduce the hours. Once that petition is filed, then the hours can be reduced. The next question is, uh, at this time, can physicians with approved I-140s, EB-2 serving in the pandemic, apply for some expedited pathways for a green card and I-485 filing? That would be great, but unfortunately, um, Congress would have to enact that kind of law. And as far as I know, they have not done anything like that. Um, that should be certainly something that employers, uh, physicians uh, should be contacting their congressional representatives or senators to um, you know, push for that kind of reform or that kind of uh, law. But right now, the USCIS does not have that kind of ability to, to make that kind of change. That is, uh, the USCIS is an administrative agency. They can only administer the laws as written. Only Congress can change that kind of um, that, that can change the law to allow this type of uh, expedited pathway. Okay, next question is, uh, how does the new immigration rules affect EB2, EB1 applicants from affected countries? So um, I'm not sure specifically which new immigration rules that are referred to. However, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, if people are outside the US um, and they have applied for EB1 or EB2, uh, the concern would be that the visa appointments, as I mentioned earlier, have been canceled. So in that case, if they are canceled or not scheduled, it will certainly delay the ability to come to the US or get your immigrant visa from outside the country. Uh, from inside the country, if you, if you have applied for um, for EB2, EB1, the processing is still the same, albeit there's no premium processing and probably the processing will be fairly slow. Okay, next question is uh, for people, <clears throat> excuse me, for people with H1B approved with consular processing, can we switch it to change of status so we don't have to leave the US at this time? If so, will the change of status take effect immediately upon approval or automatically activate on October 1st. So um, to switch it to change of status, it's possible, but that would mean to file a new application. Um, and in that case, uh, you would have to show that you have maintained status up through, or will be maintaining legal status up through October 1st, uh, which is the date that your H-1B is supposed to activate. So if you ask for consular processing, um, maybe it's because of a gap between your um, current status in the US and uh, October 1st, or if not, um, if, uh, if there is not an, a reason for consular processing, uh, then it's possible for the employer to file a new H-1B petition asking for change of status. Uh, so whether the change of status would take effect immediately upon approval is unlikely because it cannot, you cannot have an H-1B any earlier, if you're a cap H-1B any earlier than October 1st, that's just not um, possible under the law. 
Next question is, what happens if you're out of H-1B status as a result of being temporary, temporarily furloughed? So um, if, you are, if you're temporarily furloughed, um, again, that is not allowed. And so the employer would certainly um, be under violation, would be actually vi violating the H-1B rules. Um, so they actually would, you might not necessarily be considered out of status, but the employer would certainly be uh, violating the rules. Um, so my suggestion is that the employer um, not temporarily furlough you, but if that cannot, you know, if that's unable to happen, uh, they may want to consider other things such as amending the H-1B for part-time employment uh, or um, actually doing, a, 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 that would pretty, be pretty extreme, but if they actually terminate it, then you would have the ability to search for another position and still have 60 days in order to um, have time to search for another position and potentially maybe even ask for a change of status to visitor, uh, for example, in order to, uh, because of the COVID crisis. But if you have, um, if you want to talk specifically about that, um, that kind of question really probably needs to be discussed on an individual basis um, with your attorney. Feel free to contact me as well. Thank you. The next question is, issue here. Hopefully this works. Okay. The next question is, um, as an international student and international medical graduate, is it possible for such a person to have two visa statuses, F1 and H1B? Um, thus, as a student with F1 visa, can the person apply for H1B visa and work with it as a medical doctor while still on F1? Um, the short answer to that is no, there's no way to have two different statuses in the United States at the same time. You must have one status, either F1 or H1B status. Okay, the next question is, how is the current situation going to affect adjustment of status application EB1 and EB2? Well, I would basically say it's just delaying it. Um, that's really what we're seeing. There's going to be delays, um, obviously, because of um, slower processing. The USCIS, as I mentioned, is still open. I believe most of their workers, uh, most of the officers are at home. Um, however, working from home, and, and they've done that for many years. It's not a new thing for the USCIS to have um, remote workers uh, working at home. However, um, because of you know the, um, the whole situation as a whole, uh, I would imagine that they're still going to be fairly slow about processing these um, applications. So that's pretty much it's as far as eligibility and any other requirements re related to the EB1 or EB2 adjustment of status applications, that's not going to change or has not changed, but you can expect that uh, there will be slower processing. Next question is, is substantial presence test equivalent to resident for tax purposes? So that um, is something to really address with a tax uh, individual, but yes, just, just on my basic knowledge of this, um, the substantial tax advisor, I'm sorry. Uh, so if um, the substantial presence test um, says that you are a resident alien, a resident alien doesn't mean that you have a green card, it just means that you are present in the United States. Um, so if you are present in the US um, and you have legal work authorization, then more than likely you will meet the substantial presence test. But again, a um, tax advisor will be better able to, to uh, inform you of that. Next question is, what if an I-94 has an expiration date um, or an earlier expiration date than an H-1B stamp? Uh, can we have this corrected? So yes, that's a that's a good question. We get that quite a bit, regardless of COVID. So if you have an earlier expiration date than the H-1B stamp, you have two options. One is to um, basically file the H-1B extension before the I-94 expires, or um, try to go to the um, 
CBP. Uh, CBP is the Customs and Border, Border Patrol, the airport official, the officials that meet you at the airport. You can go to the local airport uh, or the airport, inter local international airport that has a CBP office, and you can request them to correct the I-94. However, we have found that it's not very um, often that they will do that. So more than likely, you will need to make sure that your uh, H-1B extension is filed before the I-94 expires, not before the, not before the H-1B expires. Next question is, for how long can H-1B employee, <clears throat> excuse me, take an unpaid leave of absence in current circumstances? Is taking an unpaid leave of absence safer than termination of employment? Um, there's no um, unpaid leave of absence. First of all, that has, that's possible, but it has to be because you are asking for it, not because the employer is asking for it. If it's something for your personal reasons that you're taking an unpaid leave of absence and the employee employer is willing to keep you as an employee uh, during that time, then that's, that's certainly possible. Uh, there's no guideline as to how long the unpaid leave of absence can be. Uh, so I would definitely talk with directly with an immigration attorney to be sure um, that that leave uh, to, to really determine under your circumstances whether or not that makes sense to have an unpaid leave of absence uh, and the reasons for the unpaid leave of absence being reasonable um, for 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 your purpose. So again, it is possible to have unpaid leave of absence if you are the one asking for it, not because the employer uh, is giving an unpaid leave of absence in lieu of termination. Okay, someone is asking to confirm the HT, uh, the I guess the um, address, internet address for maintaining legal status. And we will send the slides out um, afterwards, so I will make sure that you'll get that and you will be able to um, see it more clearly. So sorry about the uh, uh, fact that it's not as clear as possible. Is there any way of waiving the interviewing process for permanent stat resident status approval? That is up to the government to do. Uh, they can waive. And in fact, for many years, most employment based green card applications were uh, interviews were waived until uh, October 2017 under the Trump administration. Um, but waiver of interviewing process um, typically it can usually be waived in cir extreme circumstances, for example, health issues. Um, but uh, where you're unable to attend an appointment, but a blanket uh, waiver has not been given by the government yet. That is something that can certainly also, again, contact congressional representatives and ask them to push for the USCIS to do those kinds of things, considering the COVID crisis. Um, but there, that has not been addressed. I do want to say, I mean, there is supposed to be another bill coming up uh, from Congress about the COVID crisis, some of it financial, but there should be also concerns about, um, you know, keep maintaining immigrant status. And so you might want to, uh, again, contact congressional representatives and ask them to consider this as part of a bill to uh, make sure these applications uh, move forward and not be delayed uh, unnecessarily. Another question is if H-1B is furloughed uh, if an H-1B employee is furloughed, which you mentioned is not allowed, can we claim a paycheck for that period? What if we lose the job in making the claim? So, well, certainly if you are furloughed, um, yeah, the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, it does consider that to be a violation. And so you can request to the Department of Labor uh, for a finding that the um, furlough was um, not in compliance and that you're that you should be paid for that time period uh, if you if you lose the job because of making a claim again that is also a violation by the employer and uh, considered what's called retaliation and they also can be made to uh, be fined and penalized for that as well so short answer is yes it's possible um, 
but again, if you want to do that, you, you do need to talk with an attorney to be sure that um, you're, you know, you're um, protecting yourself as well through that process. Uh, the other question is, what website can we refer to for unemployment benefits? So unemployment benefits, you can refer to, to your state unemployment office. They usually will have all the details related to unemployment benefits. Um, but if you're looking for specifically related to um, whether you're a public charge and things, I will send that information out later. How many times, next question is, how many times can the 60 day grace period be used when on H1B? Um, there is a one time use of the 60 day grace period. You cannot use it multiple times um, unless it's a different, well, yeah, definitely it's, it's a one time grace period. Has USC, uh, next question is, has USCIS given any indication whether they will continue with the current visa action date traje trajectory? That is um, advancing by three months for every month for EB-1 visas. Well, the USCIS does not really um, control uh, that part of it. Uh, the visa action date is really done by the Department of State and they base that on whatever the numbers are that they receive from the USCIS as far as how many people have been approved. So they can track whether or not they've used up all of the visas available for the fiscal year. So advancing by three months for every month for EB-1 visas is not really a rule. Um, what it has been happening, but it's only because of the tracking of the numbers that are happening. So um, with respect to green card approvals. So it really just depends on how many green cards are approved, how many green cards are applied for. It's a very complicated mathematical calculation that even sometimes the Department of State doesn't really, <laughs> isn't really able to explain that well. So we just really have to see what happens with respect to those numbers. Uh, someone asked, would you advise if an extended green card expires overseas due to what would what would you advise if an extended green card expires overseas due to airport shutdowns? It still has a three months before expiration. People stuck overseas have problems to travel back. So um, if you're if you have a green card, your green card is expiring. Does not mean your status has expired. Uh, it just means that you don't have a card um, extended. You may need to um, contact the embassy. Uh, to see if they could give a stamp for you so that you can return back uh, if you're um, without any issue, if your green card has expired. But for more specific information, feel free to contact me about that for your, if this is a specific situation to you. Next question is, and we have about three minutes left. We have a lot of questions. Uh, I will only answer those questions that I have not, for, for those I haven't answered. Um, and if I have already answered a question for you, I will certainly um, take your next question and send an email um, to you. For green card applications that are being processed and waiting for the work and travel authorization, any thoughts on whether there be a delay in work travel authorization and your prediction on timing? Uh, that is definitely a prediction. I pretty much do expect there will be delays. Typically right now we're seeing about four to six months of processing time for work and travel authorization. Uh, it could be longer. I think they are trying to give priority to those and not go beyond six months, but we have seen some that have taken more than that in the past. So I would not be surprised if that could happen now with the COVID-19 uh, situation. Next question. Our green card interview has, uh, I-485 interview has been canceled. So if the medicals, uh, my question is if the medical exam expiration still applies once they reschedule appointments. Yes, so your medical exam expiration uh, depends on when you got the medical exam. Most of the time, most medical exams are good for two years. So we would need to look at that particular medical exam expiration and your overall case to determine whether or not your medical exam is still valid at the time when your uh, appointment is rescheduled. If it is not valid at that time, then you will need to take another medical exam. Uh, we're hopeful that again, because of the COVID situation, perhaps the government will extend that expiration time. They can do that. 
uh, before in the past. It actually, the there was really no enforcement of the expiration. If you submitted the medical exam, it was pretty much good forever until until your case was decided. But so they can do that. Uh, but right now, we would just have to determine uh, when your whether or not your medical exam expires at the time of the um, appointment rescheduling. Next question is, has the government suspended the filing of new H-1B visas this year? Uh, no, they have not. Uh, there's no suspension of filing any applications. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, please be sure that if you do uh, want to file a new application, go ahead and do that. Um, they are still open for business as far as new applications are concerned or extensions are concerned. So be sure you, um, you know, um, do that as at the earliest time you can. Um, let me see, I think I have, okay, we're just about up. So I'm gonna answer one more question and then the rest of them I will answer via email um, uh, to everyone. Can someone apply for EB2 residing legally inside the USA? So generally, yes, you can apply if you're residing legally in the USA. Now, the, the, the main question would be whether or not you're qualified. So again, please um, uh, contact me or another attorney, if you like, to talk about whether or not uh, you would qualify and what the process and procedure will be. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, before we wrap up, I want you to be aware, of course, as a lawyer, I have to give a disclaimer that the information that I provided here is very general and not um, should not be used for specific situations. So again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it is very important that you speak with an attorney about your specific case to get specific advice um, rather than general information. If you are interested in more inf um, information and advice, feel free to contact me. This is my contact information, um, including my email, telephone, and my calendar link in order to schedule a consultation at your convenience. Um, so thank you again for attending. I will be sending out uh, the presentation recording as well as answers to these questions. And I want everyone to stay safe and well. Have a wonderful day.